Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome on into the studio. This is ClayShare Live. Every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, we bring you a live broadcast. It's sometimes a tutorial, sometimes a demo, sometimes a Q&A session. Sometimes we travel somewhere and show you a guest studio. But tonight we have the return of one of our favorite clay instructors, Michael Harbridge, is going to be joining us. And he's going to teach you how to make hand-built spheres and do a Raku firing using your electric kiln, which is really fun. I think you're going to love this. So if you joined us a few weeks ago and you saw Michael Harbridge make his um, leafy trees and gnomes using his cone molds here, his clay puzzling molds, you're in, a treat to, in for a treat tonight because you're going to see more of that. And Michael has been teaching for decades and he has a lot of tips and techniques to share with us all. So let's get right to it. Hi, Michael. I've got a lot that I'm going to cram into this workshop tonight. Um, we're going to start out, I'm going to show you a piece coming out of my electric kiln um, that I've raku fired. And so these pieces have been holding in here for a little while. I actually took one piece out a few minutes ago and we'll, um, at the end of the, the show tonight, we'll actually take those pieces out of the trash can and you guys will get to see the raku pieces live. I'm, I'm hoping they turn out, usually they do. Um, but we will see. But this is an example of um, a raku piece. This was a pumpkin that I used make those cobblestones on with um, my raku glazes. And you'll generally get a, a lot of people think about raku as just the metallic colors. And there's lots of other glazes out there. There's crackle glaze techniques, you know, horsehair. There's lots of um, unique firings that are all part of the raku process. And and I'll just my disclaimer always is when I teach workshops is every instructor is going to have different tips and tricks. So what I share with you guys tonight, they're things that work for me. And you may take other workshops and I encourage you to take Raku workshops because that's how I learned a lot of the things that I've done. I've taken workshops from a lot of different people and learned a lot of things that worked and then things that didn't work. And so, you know, take those things that work for you, incorporate it into your artwork and the, the process of Raku is a blast. And, and as we were testing the cameras before and I flipped the camera down, I realized I had shorts on and I was like, I really should go put long pants on. Um, I should set a good example. Because <laughs> you're doing the Raku. <laughs> and so I, I quick went and changed and put long pants on. You want to do things to protect yourself. When you first do Raku the first time, most people are really intimidated because you're opening the kiln at, we're going to open it at 1680 degrees and we're going to pull things out of there that are glowing red hot. And so, you know, things like Raku gloves, their gloves, um, you'll want, you're going to have things like Raku tongs. And there are different tongs on the market. Um, Kemper makes the ones that are, are most common. And they make this one that has longer handles. And they make another one that on the end has these little teeth that stick out. I don't particularly care for the one with the little teeth. A lot of people think that they'll like that better. But what I found in workshops is sometimes when people grip their pieces, those little, there's little three little things that stick out like little nails. Sometimes your piece will slip in those as you're lifting it out. And people think they're dropping their piece and they kind of panic. And so um, I don't particularly care for those little pins on there. Plus the handle on those is shorter. And so one of the things that I always share with people is utilize the length of those handles. Don't hold the handles way up here as you go into the kiln. The further away you can be from that heat, the better. So these long handles are ideal for going down into the kiln, reaching the pieces out. Um, another thing in workshops that I share is when, if, if we're passing the tongs like to the next person, in, in my workshops, I'll allow people to take their pieces out if they feel comfortable doing it. I'll usually demonstrate the first couple of pieces or take out the ones of the people who don't want to take the pieces out. But then I always tell people, after you take your piece out, set the tongs down on the ground. Don't go like this and hand it to the next person who's gonna grab it like this with a bare hand and burn themselves. So there's a lot of safety things that you wanna keep in mind. Um, when I first started doing Raku, I had the kiln outside under our deck and um, I took pieces out and I went and set this up against the house and we had vinyl siding and the tongs melted into the side of the house. I mean, after I did it, I was like, that was really dumb, but I learned from it and I've never done it again. And I share that with other people and, and I hear, you know, funny stories all the time as well. Um, the other thing that you'll need is um, metal trash cans. 
And so I've got lots of different sizes of trash cans from large to small. I've got ones that are bigger than those. I've got ones that are smaller. Generally, I go with a can that's a little bit bigger than the piece. Like a big can like this, I probably wouldn't put a little pumpkin inside there. I would put bigger pieces inside bigger cans. Keep in mind as you're building your pieces that you don't make your pieces bigger than the biggest trash can. And I say that also from experience that I did this huge bowl one time that was beautiful. I take it out of the kiln, I go to put it in the trash can and it won't fit. It's too wide to go into the can. So, you know, keep things like that in mind. Um, we'll talk about combustible materials while we're working on the clay project. We'll talk about a lot of the different things. I wanna get this first piece out of the kiln and I'll show you guys kind of what I have rigged up. And, and I'm working with electric kilns. I've also got a gas kiln. And what I really like about my electric kilns is I can control the temperature in the kiln. And so I program my pieces when I do raku firing, I go up to 1730 degrees. So I program the kiln to go at full speed, basically turning it on high all the way up to 1730. And then I do a 10 minute hold. And that 10 minute hold kind of allows for sometimes when you rapidly fire glazes like that, you can get some bubbles in the glazes. And so that 10 minute hold usually allows those bubble, bubbles to kind of settle down on the piece. And then um, I let it drop to 1680. And at 1680 degrees, then I do a several hour hold so that if I'm not there immediately when it hits 1680, the kiln will hold at that for several hours until I get there to take the pieces out. With a gas kiln, you're generally um, using a pyrometer, which I'll show you guys in a, in a minute here. You're generally using a pyrometer and you really need to babysit that kiln so that it doesn't get too hot or get too cool. And you have to adjust the, the valve on there to control the flame and the amount of heat that's going into that kiln. Now, I have worked with gas kilns where I've managed to be able to get that lever just right that it will hold around that 1680 degrees. But you really need to be present when you're working with a kiln that's not programmable. So that's one of the things that I love about the programmable kiln. A lot of people ask, does it hurt the kiln? And I had a conversation with several of the kiln manufacturers about this and, and, and their response usually was, well, it's not good for the kiln, but no firings really are good for the kiln. And so, you know, does it really hurt the elements? Not really. Does it really hurt the brick? No. Your brick expands and contracts during firing. You know, you've all, all of you that have kilns probably have a crack in the bottom of your kiln. Every kiln, people freak out when they, after the first few firings and have a crack in the bottom, they're like, oh my gosh, my kiln cracked on the bottom. Read the manual. It usually says in there, that's normal to happen. So um, it doesn't really hurt the kiln. A lot of people ask about that. And several of the kiln manufacturers are like, no, it really doesn't affect it. I had, I just replaced um, one of my Raku kilns not too long ago. I usually use them for about 10 years and then I sell those kilns. And so um, in that 10 years that I had my last two scup kilns that were out here, I never replaced the elements on them. And I fire Raku regularly. So um, it, it, again, it doesn't, I think firing, high firing in a kiln is more um, damaging to the elements than anything with Raku firing. All right. Thank so you. I've so I'm just going to let everybody question. know because I, I, I didn't mention earlier when I did the intro that if you have any comments or questions for Michael, if you just type them in to wherever you're watching and then I will relay them to Michael. If it's something we've already uh, addressed and he's already answered, I'll just type in the answer for you so he doesn't have to answer, you know, things he's already answered just to save time because we're limited on what we can do tonight because of yeah. time. All right. Yeah. Sorry yeah, to interrupt, Michael. Go ahead. All right, so I've got my trash can here and I've got it lined with dry newspaper. Any dry materials will work. Some people will use leaves, straw, dry grass, anything that's dry that, that will catch on fire. The reason I like newspaper is because it burns quickly and it doesn't leave what's called scarring on the pieces usually. Um, things like leaves, sometimes the stems of leaves, when you put that piece into the leaves, um, some glazes are very soft when they go in. And sometimes the stem of that leaf will embed into that glaze and then it hardens really quickly and you'll get kind of a sharp edge and that's called scarring on your pieces. And I can always tell when I go to art shows and I'll pick up somebody's raccoon pieces and I'll feel the bottom and I'll be like, oh, but you use leaves or you use straw. And they're like, yeah, how'd you know? And I'm like, you know, I 
I can tell by the texture usually that's that's on the bottom of the piece. Now, some matte glazes don't do the scarring, but some gloss glazes will. Glossy, those dull, thin, cheap paper of the, the standard newspaper, um, whether it's black and white or color, um, it burns quickly and ignites quickly, where some of that glossy, heavier stock paper doesn't ignite as quickly. So I've lined about five to seven layers of newspaper inside the can. And these cans are very seasoned. It is very black. It's covered with black creosote gook, and that's good. Um, just like some stoneware pieces, they say to season them, you know, baking uh, stones and things. And so that that sticky, gooey stuff that's on there is good because you get a tighter seal with a lid. When a can is brand new, I'll usually wrap a wet towel around it the first few times that I fire, and that gives me a better seal on the lid, and it cuts down on some of the smoke. But I've got newspaper lined around the sides of this can, and I've got it sitting a few feet away from the kiln, and I'm going to flip the camera down a little bit. And what I've got hooked up to the lid on my kiln is a pulley system. So I'm going to bring the camera over here. And so on the lid, I've got the metal cable that comes around and there's a hook that I can hook onto that lid and I can disconnect this when I'm not doing using the kiln for Eku because I do regular firings in this kiln. And then that cable goes up to the ceiling and there's a hook with a pulley and it's a metal pulley. And then the cable comes out from there and loops around. And that's what I usually will have somebody here who is going to help me with it. And they will grab these loops and they will pull on this open the lid of the Oops, I just knocked my, my thing over here. But this is what you'll get. And so I'm just going to lift it a, a little bit there by pulling on this cable with the pulley. You don't want to go up to this kiln and lift the lid. The heat that's going to initially come out of that kiln is there's a lot of heat that comes out. You do not want to have your arm going up like this. You will definitely burn the underside of your arm. So that metal cable is important. And so I have it going from the, from the lid up to the ceiling, and then it's going to come across. And over on this side, I've got a post with a screw. So when I'm doing this alone, I've got a loop in that cable that I can open that lid, put that loop on there, pull a couple pieces out, and then um, I can put the lid back down with the kiln heat back up and take out some more pieces. So I've got two pieces in here. I've got um, one of the leaf pieces that I'm going to show you how we're going to do that tonight. And then I've also got a tree that I built, a leafy tree that I built um, in one of the last, was it two weeks ago? Um, and I've got that rack food garden. I'm going to take that out tonight too. My kiln room, if you're going to do rack food, generally one of the reasons people use gas kilns too is because they can take that kiln outside. Um, when we added the studio on a couple of years ago, um, we put in this kiln room that is an indoor outdoor kiln room. And so all around me are glass doors. And these open and slide out. And so there's another whole side here that opens up. So all that smoke goes out of here. And then I've got a door straight ahead of me that goes into the studio. So I'm going to flip the camera down here. I'll get the, the kiln and the trash can here so you guys can see what I'm going to do. So I've got my tongs ready. I've got my lid to my trash can. I don't have it standing up on the side of the trash can because I don't want to have to bend over and stick my face in the flames to get that lid to put on. So I put the lid far enough away so that I can safely pick that lid up. So I'm going to take, I've got my cable here and I'm going to pull this and I'm going to put this as a loop. And you'll see the film is blowing very hot. I want to get it just a second. And then I'm going to reach in. I'm going to pull my glowing piece out. And I'm going to set it down inside 
of that trash can with the combustible. Now, a lot of people think it's a huge waste to see how quickly you can get the piece in the can and get the lid on the can. I left the piece flame for a little while. I let it flame for a little while and I look inside the can and make sure that the paper is engulfed well and the, um, the piece, a lot of times you'll actually see the metallics developing on the piece as it's flaming. All right, so I've got that first piece out and I'm gonna bring the second piece out. And this one is gonna be the leafy tree. A lot of times you'll hear the kiln beeping. The alarm goes off on there because the kiln is kind of freaking out. It's going, it just dropped 200 degrees in a matter of seconds. So the alarm will go off. Press stop on there. All right. I'm going to get this trash can out of here. We're going to set these aside. They're going to cool off. And then we're going to come back and we're going to take those out later. Now, I get a lot of people that ask about firing with a manual kiln. Do you have questions, Jessica? Everybody is just, I think, mesmerized. A few people are, are, <laughs> didn't know you could do it with your electric kiln. They've never done Raku before, and they want to now do Raku. Um, you know, this is this is just, I think, fascinating for so many people because I was taught Raku with gas. So yeah. I've never done it with an elect electric kiln, but um, a, a question, could you use a small test kiln? For yeah, electric? and I actually, I have some little test kilns here, sure. and then they're great because a lot of those will plug into a regular outlet. And so, you know, a lot of us have outlets on the outside of our homes or on the outside of our studios, and we can um, just plug those little kilns in, and they're, they're great for it. Yeah. I think, I think it's a great way to start. Opening the lid, I usually stand behind the kiln and have somebody lift the lid up so that the heat isn't coming out of their face. So they just kind of stand up and pull that lid open. All right, so some of you probably have manual kilns. I get this question all the time. So I found this manual kiln somebody was selling on Facebook a while ago and I'm like, I am gonna buy it so I can do rec in manual kilns. Um, so this one has switches. A lot of manual kilns will have like low, medium, high switches on them. So the actual heating process, you're going to put the pieces in the kiln. I never stilt raku pieces, so I always dry coat them. And the reason I do that is because for those of you who have kilns, you've probably experienced where you're taking a glazed piece out of the kiln with a stilt, and that stilt sticks to the bottom until you get it just outside the kiln, and then it falls off, hits the floor, and, and breaks. You don't want 1,680 degrees stilt hitting the floor, bouncing up on somebody's foot and burning them. So I always dry foot the pieces. I always put a kiln wash shelf in there. So if any glaze does come off of it, um, it, it doesn't stick to the shelf. So with the manual kiln, the loading process, everything is basically the same. The main difference is you're going to flip all the switches to the high position or on position. It's going to heat up and you're going to use I suggest a digital pyrometer that you can put the, the sensing rod into a people plug on the kiln. And then you can monitor the temperature of that kiln. And I'll hold this up to the camera here. Right now it's 71, it looks like. If I touch the end of this, the temperature should go up. And you can see how rapidly that goes up with me just pinching the end of it. Um, so you'll watch it. And when you get to that 1680, 1730 range, then you're going to have to control the switches. And on some kilns, you're going to turn like one switch to medium, one switch to low. You kind of have to play around and then watch the number on the pyrometer that will show you what the temperature is. And you can usually get it where, and it's only a 10 minute hold, so it's not a long time to sit there and flip the switches around. Um, on a kiln like this that just has their like light switches on it. This was an old um, even heat kiln. Um, it's just a matter of turning one or two of the switches off. And so just watch that temperature, try to create that hole. Now people ask, 
well, you know, I've done workshops where they go hotter with the glaze firing. And that is true. I've taken workshops where they do hotter fire as well. And I found that me personally, I get better results when I put the cooler temperature. So 1730 is my maximum temperature. I hold for 10 minutes. I let it drop to 1680. And that's where I do a long hold so I can take the pieces out at 1680. Now, if I take one or two pieces out, and the kiln drops down to 1530 degrees. I want to close that kiln up and let it get back up to that 1680 range before I take. You'll a lot of times you'll have two kilns. Like by the time I get the cans. Done, so we're getting a Michael. We're getting a bit of an echo. I don't know if your second camera is picking up audio as well as your first. Maybe I'm not sure. Kevin, do you do you get the audio? I'm getting an echo on my end too, and I saw a few people. Yeah, I can mention see the. The um, I don't know if Kevin can mute that one or if I need to, but um, can you mute the other camera, Kev? Sorry, everybody. Yeah, I'm sorry. Technology. Yay. No, it's okay. We'll get it fixed. Okay. It looks like Kevin's we're just got excited it. we get two cameras with you, and that way we can be out in the kiln room with the raccoon and then back in when you uh, do the tutorial. Yeah. So, so, yeah, basically, you're doing the exact same thing with this. You're just monitoring the temperature with this. The one that you put in usually go a little bit high. You're going people will say, well, I'll just prop up the, the weight and push in the plunger and I won't worry about cone. And that's really dangerous because if you forget about that, that kiln is going to continue to heat up. So always go like an 06 is a little bit hotter than what 1730 is. And that way the kiln will shut off if you forget about it um, by having that cone in there. And then always throw that cone out after you're done doing that firing. Don't reuse that cone. All right. It's a lot Good when people I'm, want to do um, a hold and yeah, that's great. One other quick thing I'm going to mention with these tongs, always have an Allen wrench handy. Um, I've gone to a lot of studios where when these, um, when this little thumb screw gets loose in here from opening and closing, the tips of these tongs want to crisscross one another. They, and it's just this little screw here that the Allen wrench fits into. Every once in a while, I tighten that so that my tongs meet up. If they start crisscrossing, you're gonna have issues when you're pulling those pieces out of the kiln where they're gonna want to crisscross and it's gonna feel like you're dropping your pieces. All right, so we are gonna go, I'm gonna go, just a bit four steps away into the studio here. And I'll have Kevin flip over to that other camera. And then we're gonna come out at the end tonight and I'm just gonna bring the trash cans in and we'll take the pieces out and reveal what you guys will see in the trash can. All right. Yeah, fantastic. So again, if you have questions, type them in, I'll pass them along to Michael. Now, Michael did say that he, in the beginning, if you missed it, he did mention that it is no harder on your kiln to use your electric kiln for raku firings than just a regular firing in your electric kiln. So I've seen a lot of questions about that, that people are concerned if it would wear their kiln faster, wear them out faster, but it doesn't. So, and you can use it for raku firing and then you can do a firing that is just a regular firing. So use the same kiln. You don't need a separate kiln for it. Yep. Yeah, last night I fired some stoneware in that same kiln. And this is, so this is the technique that we're gonna to do tonight. And one of the pieces that I put into the, the trash can out there was a smaller version of this one. And I did it with raku glazes. I did it with a, a gloss and there's areas I wiped back and then there's the area of the leaves. I just did solid glaze on the leaves. This is a low fire. Um, this was done on low fire clay. Um, using Mako Stroke and Coat for the colors. I'll talk about what we did there. And then it's their copper adventure, adventuring that I used on the bottom on this bark texture. Um, this vase was done. Um, this was stoneware. This was um, continental clay's buff stoneware, just a, a buff colored stoneware. And um, I used Mako Stroke and Coat on the leaves here as well. And this was, I compared to cone five last night. And so you get nice, bright, vibrant colors with stroke and coat. And if you look at, if I put these two next to each other, you've got you know the same bright vibrancy using the same colors on there. The bottom of the piece I used, uh, I left the bottle out here because I knew I'd forget. 
copper jade on the bottom of it. And I wanted to pick up that texture of the bark on there. The top is just black stroke and coat over that texture just wiped back. Um, and then I did this little one with um, stone denim, Mako's uh, stone denim. That's also one of their stoneware glazes. You get a nice breaking effect on the edges of that texture on that piece. We do have a couple of questions that came in. Okay. So the question is how many Raku pieces do you put in the same trash can? That's a very good question. So I generally only put one piece in a trash can. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One is if I um, put multiple pieces in a trash can, if it has a glaze on it that is kind of molten when you put it in there um, and it tips into another piece, it can stick to it. Um, so you have to be very, very careful. The other thing is when you put a piece into the trash can and you wait to get another piece out of the kiln and get it into that same trash can, you are letting that piece in the can cool a little bit more and more oxygen is getting to it. And a lot of people will take and throw more combustibles on top of it and kind of smother the piece to keep it warm. And I find with a lot of my Raku pieces, generally if the pieces get smothered, I get a lot more copper. I don't get as many other colors on there. So I don't like to smother my pieces unless if I've got somebody that's like, I just want all copper on my piece. And then I try to smother it and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. There are so many variables that affect Raku that when I get people that are like, I want lots of blues and purples. Well, good luck with that. Um, it, there is no, I mean, there are little tips and tricks that, like I said, with the, getting more copper, that if I smother the piece, I find that, that I get more copper. Um, but it's really how quickly you fire it, what glazes you use, um, the temperature outside, how windy it is outside, how damp it is, all of that stuff affects the Raku process. So, so just yeah. one, I just do one piece in a can. That was a got, do you, that. yeah, that's okay. We had a couple more. Do you like the K2 instruments pyrometer the best? I do. It's, it's inexpensive um, compared to some others. I know there are better ones on the market, but I've had that pyrometer I have used for years and years. I think I've replaced the battery in it twice and it has served its purpose very well for me. Good, good. I ordered then, one on uh, Amazon a few years ago because it was really inexpensive. Or no, it wasn't on Amazon. It was through um, wish.com. And it came and it only had Celsius reading. It didn't have Fahrenheit. Yeah, some of them do. They're only they're only Celsius. And so you or right. only Fahrenheit. It just depends which one you get. Yep. So question about um, they've seen some potters lift the lid to flash flame the oxygen out, is there any advantages or disadvantages of doing that? I missed the first part of the question. That they've seen um, some potters will lift their lid on the trash can to flash flame the oxygen out. And, and I generally don't, and, that, you know, and that's where you're gonna find a lot of Raku artists are gonna have different things that they do. And I've tried a lot of different things from using cow manure as my combustible to, um, I had somebody tell me they use red onion peels and they got more burgundies and stuff in there. And they were getting red onion peels from um, somebody that worked at Subway. And I tried it and sure enough, I got these really deep burgundies and stuff on my pieces um, as a result. Um, so like I said, take a lot of these tips and stuff from, from different artists and you will learn a lot and, and play around to see what works for you. Um, there was one more. Let's see. I want to get this last question, then we'll move on because I I, we, I know we got a lot to cover. I don't. Okay, I think I lost that comment. All right. So if you ask me, ask the question, and I didn't get to it, we'll uh, we'll get back to it. All oh, right. do you tape your Allen tool to the tongs? I I actually do. I have a piece of duct tape on the end that I have one taped to it, and I went to tape it before, and it's missing. So it must have fallen oh, no. out in one of my workshops, and I have to go find that same size one. <laughs> And yeah, I do. I have duct tape on the end where my hand holds it, keeping it on there. So I always have it. And so the other, that question I just found out is, can you use V-Mix and Stroke and Coat for Raku? Can you use any clay or does it have to be a Raku clay? So I have played around with a lot of different clay bodies. And um, if you're hand building, Raku clay body is going to work the best. Um, 
there is sand and there's some chemicals. I don't know the exact makeup of, of that clay body, um, but it's designed to withstand that thermal shock. Um, a lot of your stoneware clay bodies and things have sand in them. And so what I usually suggest if you're using earthenware clay or something that's not a raku body, I find that if you fire it slightly cooler, instead of going to an 04 for your greenware firing, I go to an 06 or an 07. And that little bit softer bisque, I have a lot less cracking with those pieces. And then this is a good one. I've seen people spray air on pieces before placing them in the trash can. What does that do? Yeah, so I've seen people spray air. I've seen people spray rubbing alcohol. Um, there's lots of different things. And so, and, and I've seen people, you know, put it in the trash can and take it out and dunk it in water or spray it with water. And one of the first workshops that I took, um, we were spraying water on it and half of the pieces in the workshop were splitting. And I was like, I am not going to teach a workshop and disappoint all those people with um, having pieces break. And so air spraying onto the piece, I think would kind of cause the piece to get, um, to develop quicker and you might get some type of rings or th something. I've never tried that on the piece. I tried the rubbing alcohol on it and I really didn't get much different results. The, the technique that I do is simple. We leave it in the can for at least 15 minutes. The longer I leave it in there, the better, but usually after 15 minutes, my colors have developed in there. But if I take it out and it's really hot and it hits the cool air, those colors can change while um, the, the um, pieces are, are cooling when the cool air hits it. So you don't want to take it out too soon. Okay. All right. All right. So I've got, um, is, am, are we getting an echo again? I can see my other camera lighting up. I mean, I'm, just I'm not hearing an echo on my end. Okay, so if I anybody does, good. I'll Yeah, so if you get all out there listening, if you hear an echo, let us know and we'll do what we need to do to take care of it. All right, so what I'm doing now to build these pieces and to do this with the leaves, and you're probably like, oh my gosh, Mike, you do everything with leaves. I love leaves and I love these <laughs> leaf forms and I love to show people multiple ways to use products after they buy them. So this is a new um, series of molds. These are some new flat bottom steer shapes. And so the bottom of this is flat rather than being rounded all the way around. And then the top has a very large opening so you can get your hand down inside because I've wanted to make spheres that are all leaves. But the problem was I couldn't get in there really to press well and I would lose a lot of that texture from the leaf forms. So um, <clears throat> these have big openings. We have a large, we have a medium. I've got them on the website. And the very bottom of this piece you need to have some type of a solid area because if you do all leaves on here, the piece is just gonna be so fragile that it's really gonna be hard to pick that up and fire it. I was even worried about picking that piece up out of the kiln by the top of those leaves and, and possibly breaking it. And I was relieved that that didn't happen. So on the bottom of my piece, I'm gonna do some solid clay. I already have this half done. And while I was talking here, I was pressing clay against my bark texture pad. And so I just tear off pieces of clay, I press it against there and I get my bark texture. I'm not particular, some pieces are bigger, some pieces are smaller, some are long um, and I make a whole bunch of those. And then I set them inside the mold and I overlap each of those pieces slightly. Now I'm getting an echo. Now you're getting an echo. Let me go turn off the sound on that one. And I'm just going to give everybody a quick reminder that um, Raku pieces are decorative only. They are not food safe. So they're, they are pieces you would make. You're not going to eat off of or drink food out of or anything because the clay stays porous. It never vitrifies. Um, and so, you know, they're not appropriate for food. I just want to yep, put that I reminder out there. Some... asking about glazing the inside of pieces in using a yeah, vase. And no. I'm like, no, because you there's do no get crazing yeah. in that, that finish, right. whether you can see it or not. So I'm laying these pieces with the bark texture facing against the mold. And normally with the clay puzzling techniques, you would press this and you would squish this down, but I don't want to lose that bark texture. So what I do is I just go in and I just kind of drag my finger across and mash these pieces together without pressing real hard. And I just want to mash it together where the joints are. And I purposely want to have these pieces overlapping so that I get some nice texture on the outside. If I press too hard, I will lose the, 
the bark texture, and it will make the outside of this really flat. And I want it to have a lot of texture. Now, to get it so that I'm only going to go up part way with this, to get it so that the, the sides come to the same point, I lay the molds next to each other. So on this side, I set it this way. And then I know that I need to come up to about here with my bark. And so I'll lay pieces in here. And then to get the other side, I pick that mold half up and I switch them. And then I bring this over to this side and I've got it to about the same point on this side. So I'm gonna squish these together. And one of the things that I, I found, and I was saying before, I was a little nervous about the leaves on the top of that vase and how fragile it was going to be. So on this one, I'm going to do leaves, and then I'm going to do more bark at the top to give me more of a, a nice solid structure at the top. So I'm going to do a row here of bark along the top of each half. And again, I'm just going to squish these together, just dragging my finger. And what I look for in there is I don't want to see the line where that piece of clay was. I want that to be really squished and dragged across so that those pieces are attached really well. I'm going to do the same thing on this other half. And sometimes on this top, it's just going to slide down for now and we'll slide it back up when we start adding the leaves in here. All right, I'm gonna set that aside. The rubber leaves, if you missed that in my last live, these are flexible rubber leaves. I tear off a piece of clay that is about a quarter to a half an inch thick, and I press the rubber leaf into the clay, just using my thumb. And instead of cutting around it, I just pull the clay away from the edges. I get the majority of that clay pulled away and then I flip it over and I use my thumb to bevel the edge just to get the edge of this thin. And then this oak leaf, I always show this one first because this has some kind of tight areas in here. Then I'll take my finger from the back side and I'll kind of pull up in where those indentations are to get that excess clay out of those areas. If I can't get it out with my finger, sometimes I'll use a wooden tool to do that. And then I just pull the leaf away and I've got my clay leaf. Now I'm going to lay these face down and I'm going to have them overlap the bark area just slightly. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to take and drag my finger to attach that leaf into the bark and continue. So I'll make a whole bunch of, of leaves here using the different shapes. Again, bevel the edge. This goes a lot quicker than sitting and trying to cut around the leaf. And if you just cut around it, you generally get a really thick, clunky looking leaf on the edge. And I want it to be thin on the edge. But if you try to make the clay too thin, the clay won't peel away from your leaf form. So if you go to peel that clay away and it's ripping and tearing and sticking to the rubber leaf form, it's usually because you've got the clay too thin. So between a quarter to a half an inch thick on something like this, and then bevel just the edge. So the edge of it is thin, but the heart of the leaf is nice and thick and durable. I had a question. Do you have a favorite Raku clay and glaze brand that you use? Um, I work primarily with Continental Clay. I'm in Wisconsin. Continental Clay is in Minneapolis, and I order clay by the skid from Continental, and that is my preference just because of location. I think they make a good clay, um, and I work with their Raku clay. I work with their uh, stoneware clays. I work with their low fire white, their low fire red. I've used a lot of their clay bodies and have been very happy with it. And they're a good company to work with. But I always tell people, find something local. If you can go pick it up and you don't have to pay shipping, 
on clay, that's a whole lot smarter than paying a fortune to have clay shipped across the country, unless if it's a, a clay body that you just love and it's you know so unique that you uh, prefer to work with that. Yeah, clay is expensive to have shipped. If you can if you can pick it up nearby with a like a you know hour or less drive, I totally think it's worth it. Yep. And for me to, to drive to Minneapolis, it's about a seven hour drive. Yeah, that's a little far. I wouldn't do seven hours. Yeah. And it, <laughs> you know, for a few hundred dollars to have a, a skid of it shipped and have them show up with a semi, wheel it off of the semi, put it in my garage, that's easier than driving and, and picking it up and, and doing that. Now, as far as glazes, um, I've worked with a lot of different glazes from the different manufacturers and kind of a funny story I had used um, when Mako first came out with their glazes. Um, we, I was at Inseca and I was there for, for Royal Brush. And when you have a booth full of brushes, it's kind of boring and isn't quite as appealing as a booth that has a bunch of cool artwork in it. And so I took some Raku pieces and had it on our table and it got people to come up and, and talk to us and ask about the Raku. And then we would, you know, talk to them about brushes. And so um, Colleen, the owner of, of Mako Colors came up and we were talking and she said, oh, whose glaze is on that piece there? And I said, that's your copper penny. And she's like, no way. She's like, I've never seen anybody get colors like that. And, and I said, well, I said, what I do a little bit different is I fire it cooler than what you recommend on the label. And I said, you know, how did you guys decide what temperature to fire it to? And she's like, I don't know. She said, Steve, who was their chemical engineer at the time, she's like, I don't know, ask Steve about it. She's like, I don't know about any of that stuff. And so I went and talked to Steve and I said, you know, how did you decide on those temperatures? And he's like, well, that's pretty much the standard in the industry of what all the other glaze manufacturers recommended. And so, you know, that's kind of what we went with. And so play around with temperatures. When you're, when you're doing Raku, um, I find that with other people's glazes, I get better results going to that 1680, you know, the 1730 and pulling at 1680. Um, some of them go a lot hotter, go up into the 1800s, um, or it's recommended 1800s on their label. So play around and try different temperatures. Um, I, have I have my own line of Raku glazes. I've got four colors. I've got a gloss finish, which is my jade gloss. I've got, and that I used on one of the pieces that we'll take out in a little while. And then I have a matte finish kaleidoscope is a true matte color, um, has a little bit of a texture to it. And then um, I have copper matte, which actually comes as a powder and you just mix it with water. And that one, what's really cool about it is if you put any gloss glaze underneath it, it is a true matte glaze. If you put any gloss glaze underneath it, it doesn't matter what color, when it fires, it will turn that area of the Raku glaze glossy. So a lot of times I'll do designs underneath the, um, the matte Raku glaze, the copper matte, and those designs come out glossy and then it's all matte around it. We've done stuff in workshops where we flick glaze at pieces and we've taken them outside and we've taken a big hot K brush and flicked the glaze up and we get, it looks like blades of grass coming up on the, the pieces. We've done sponging with sea wool sponges with gloss glazes. And it's a great way to use up odds and ends of gloss glazes um, and, and just use them up on your raku. You don't see the color. So it might be, you know, baby poop gold that you're thinking, why did I buy this color? And I'll never use this, it's such a hideous color. Well, just use it underneath and you don't see that baby poop gold color, you just see the Raku finish. All right, so I've got this side is pretty well done. I'm gonna make some leaves for this one. And then I also have one called Duck Feathers, which is kind of a satin finish. It has a little bit of a sheen, um, but it's, it's fairly matte. And they all are um, what I'm gonna call copper bearing glazes, um, that they will all get various metallic finishes. Um, you'll get, 
uh, blues and purples and fuchsias and coppers and oranges. And sometimes you'll get bright gold colors in there. Um, one raccoon artist told me that um, fuchsias and purples are usually kind of the hardest colors to get in your raccoon firing. So when you get purple and fuchsia, you've done something right. Um, then try replicating it to get, you know, if you do the exact same thing again, there are so many variables that can affect the raccoon that you may or may not get the exact same result the next time you fire. I have a question about the term skid because we don't use that here. So is it the same as a pallet? Is a thousand pounds? Is that what a skid of clay is? Yeah. So yeah, pallet of, of clay is. Uh, I think I usually get about twenty five hundred pounds of. So clay you get a little more than a ton. Yeah. Of clay because yeah. that'd be two thousand. Usually getting four or five different types of clay at a time. And so I you're just a, using the term skid as a, the pallet that everything's all pallet, piled onto. Yeah. It's not necessarily an amount of clay. It's however much you want. No. And you like it's right. a, a skid pounds. in Wisconsin, a skid is a pallet. I know we have some different, <laughs> different ways of saying things. People tell me <laughs> I have an accent. I don't think I have an accent. Well, you know, but <laughs> I don't think you have an accent either, Michael. Not at all. <laughs> I travel a lot. Uh, so, I get a lot of people saying that. Uh, would you hold up one of the leaves um, after you peel it off to the camera so people can see the details of the veins? I, my camera's, yeah. my, my screen's a little fuzzy. There you go. I can see that crystal clear. So this though. is one of the dahlia leaves. This is the oak leaf. And these were made from real leaves. This, this company that makes these, and I have these on my website, and um, I just put in another order with her yesterday. I thought we had enough leaves ordered, and the orders keep coming in for them, and I sent her another order yesterday and she's like, oh, you're killing me. Cause they, hand, these. these are all, they're made in the U S and it's a family run business. And she's thrilled. I mean, she, she's given me a hard time that I'm killing her, but I'm like, yeah, your bank account is loving it though. And she's like, yeah, it is. It's she's good like, good for small businesses to be busy. Yeah. Right. And, and so they have to like hand pour these. And then when they come out of the mold, they have to cut around them and cut these out. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. And like the holly leaves, we've sold thousands of holly leaves. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh my gosh, cutting those out. And I look at some of these, like this is a mum leaf. And I'm like, some of these and the oak leaf, like cutting around all of those. I'm like, oh, you must have blisters on your fingers. And yeah, so. that's, that's a tedious job. What size yeah. leaves are you using? So these range from about an inch and a half up to about four inch leaves. Um, there's an assortment of small leaves, which most people have done the small assortment. Um, and that works great for these. You get into the medium leaves like this is a hydrangea leaf, you know, compared to the dahlia, um, you know, that hydrangea is, is a great leaf too, but it's, it's getting into the bigger sizes. So there's large leaves, medium leaves, and small leaves. The large leaves, I mean, there's big rhubarb leaves that are, are gigantic. All right, I've just about got this done. I'm going to add a couple more leaves in here, and then we'll put it together, and I'll show you how you can join. These pieces. I was also I did a, a project doing this technique on a bisque plate. And so I made all these leaves and I put them just in a bisque plate and in a bisque bowl and did basically this technique. Um, but I had the texture facing up. And so when I attached the leaves, I had to score wherever they were going to overlap and put some slip in there to attach them. And um, we did a raccoon firing on that. And I don't have that piece anymore. I got to make some more of those. And that was a really, really cool piece because when you do raccoon firing, um, some of the things that will affect your finish are, you know, again, how quickly you get it out of the kiln and into the trash can. If it's a very windy day, um, I've had cases where somebody takes too long to get it into the trash can and that cold wind hits that piece and I see, if I see a lot of green on a piece, because most of these glazes that I work with, I mentioned are copper bearing. And so one of the ingredients that makes a nice 
blue-green glaze is copper. So um, if I start seeing that it's a blue-green color, usually that tells me the piece got a little bit cool when it came um, out of the kiln and got into the trash can. And so a lot of times when people are for their first time taking pieces out, they're a little cautious and a little hesitant for, for obvious reasons. And um, it'll get a little bit cooler in the air. Or some people, I, I sometimes encourage um, kind of moving the piece back and forth in the can and kind of tipping and turning it. And so when I have pieces that have openings like this in it, the flames work between all of these openings and kind of bounce off of the piece. And I get a lot better and more interesting color usually when I've got um, pieces with openings. I've done extruder pieces. You'll see on my Facebook page, if you go into some of my images on there, I've got um, pieces that I've done all coil work with them, vases and bowls and things. And those, when you fire those um, Raku and you get all those flames going between everything, gives you really cool, cool um, colors bouncing off between. And then the next time I could do the same piece and it might turn out completely different. That's one of the things with Raku is you never know what you're gonna get till you take it out of the trash can. And a few folks are asking about your website um, it's learnfiredarts.com, and Michael is running a promo right now where you can save 10% off on his clay puzzling molds, and that's what the big mold he's using to make the shape, and that code is ClayShare10, capital C-L-A-Y-S-H-A-R-E-10, and that'll get you a discount off the clay puzzling molds. Um, we're also giving away a set of those molds tonight, too, at 6 o'clock, which is in 8 minutes, not, yep. not to rush. I mean, we can go over. Put together we can, in about a minute. We can go we'll... over a little bit if we have to, though. Everybody will wait to All see right. who won. <laughs> so what I'm adding on now on this piece is I'm adding some more of the bark texture that's going to stick up above the edge. And I'm going to mash that to attach it the same way that I did the other pieces. And the reason I'm putting this on here is so that when I put this mold together and put the other half on here, I will have some clay that will join to the other side. I'm going to bend this inward so that when I put that other mold half on, that clay won't get caught between. And then up on the top, I'm gonna to put some to attach to the other side as well. And then I'm gonna prep a few leaves because I'm going to put some leaves on the inside of there that are gonna fill in the gap to attach the two halves. And this is why I wanted molds that I could get my hands inside of because the normal technique is putting a coil of clay along there and then taking the press tool and reaching in the mold and squishing it down. Well, if you squish these leaves, you lose that texture. And I didn't want to lose that texture. So I'm going to get a few leaves ready here. And when I first did this technique, I didn't have these leaves ready. I put the two mold halves together and my leaves started when I stood this up started kind of falling in on the piece. So have these leaves made before you put the mold together. It will save you some headaches. I still learn things every time I do techniques. And sometimes I do it as a workshop and it is a one-time workshop because I discover that it's a horrible workshop. It's a great project, but sometimes it's just a horrible <laughs> workshop. And so sometimes I'll tell people, you know what? And it's not the people. It's just the technique, just like sometimes people just don't get it, they struggle with it. And so um, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna do that as a workshop again. But if we learn Live from it, learn. that's what's important. I'm gonna make about four leaves. So I'm gonna do one more leaf and then we'll put this together. And then the nice thing is we can open this up immediately and on large pieces like this, I will generally um, let them sit in half the mold for a little while. Now, once I take the Raku piece out of the trash can, it's still gonna be warm. And so I use the Raku gloves to do that. And when I open that trash can, I usually kind of step back. I don't stick my face right down in that can to reach in and pull that piece out. I usually open that can 
And I will kind of lean back as I do that because there's usually some pretty nasty smoke that's gonna come out of that can. All right, so I'm gonna put the mold half down that has the extra clay on it. I've got these edges pinched in and I'm gonna wrap my fingers around this other half of the mold. So as I flip this around, this clay is gonna to wanna to pop out of here. So I wanna have, you'll see my hands are inside as I set that down. And once I have it set down, then I will slide my hands back out. There is a Velcro strap that comes with the mold. I take that strap and I wrap that around the mold nice and tight. And I'll hold this end of the strap while I bring the other end up and I pull it nice and tight. And then I can stand this piece up. And it's probably gonna be hard for you guys to see on the inside. But what I'm doing is I'm reaching in in the top and where my pieces of bark were on the top, I'm just kind of gently squishing that. I'm using my thumbs to kind of go in and squish that to both sides to make sure that that's attached on the top. And then I'm gonna go into the bottom where it overlaps and I'm gonna take that clay. And so I've got on the bottom, I basically have clay on this side of the mold and then I've got that piece of clay that's kind of overlapping it. I'm just reaching in and I'm squishing that together like I did on all of those bark pieces. Again, I don't wanna reach in with the press tool and do this because if I just press straight down, I'm going to um, use my texture. So I'm gonna use the, the flashlight here. Yeah, I don't think that's showing up in the camera very well, but um, I'm just reaching in, I'm just squishing it, but I'm using the light in here so I can see the insides. And once I have all of those, the bark area squished down, then I'm gonna take my extra leaves that I made and I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna put those in so that it attaches both halves where the leaves are. And I may or may not use all four of them, but I wanna make sure that I have enough. So that mold you're using there is your large um, this is the large sphere mold. mold. Yep. The bowl sphere the clay bowl sphere, puzzling mold. Yep. yep. So that's All the right. large. So I only, only ended up using two of the leaves. And then I can take this and turn it on its side. And I can remove that Velcro strap. And then I just kind of gently lift that half of the mold up. And I've got my piece. And so you can see that the leaves, there are bumps and textures in here. I don't want them to be smooth. I want them to look like the leaves are overlapping. And I'll leave it in half of the mold like this for a little while. Um, sometimes I'll put a fan on it just to kind of firm it up. And then I'll take the mold and I'll flip it over into my hand and I'll lift that piece out of the mold. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of a seam line along there. But honestly, because this wasn't pressed real hard, very rarely do I get clay oozing out. There's a little chunk right here that I just flicked off with my finger. Um, and then, you know, let this dry like you would any hand-built piece that you've made and fire it. You don't fire it in the mold. You're going to fire it outside of the mold. The mold could be fired, but it's not necessary. You want to take that out of the mold. Any imperfections or sharp edges on there, you can um, just take a wet brush or a little sponge and go along and, and before you fire it, once the clay is dry and kind of smooth out any sharp edges that, that might be on there. All right. Um, I'm just okay. gonna talk really quickly. This piece I showed, this one was done inside of a, a mold, but the leaves were laid inside of the mold and the clay was pressed over the top. And so then when I took this out of the mold, I had to peel the leaves away after it came out of the mold. So that's another way to use it inside the molds as well. All right. Yeah, Any I love that. Any questions on that or we will that. go and take out the raccoon pieces. Anybody want to see the raccoon pieces? Yes, we all want to see the raccoon pieces. All right. So we'll I'm going to see keep what's it on, in the trash. Yep, I'm going to keep it on this camera. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to grab the camera grab and bring it up here because I've got right. better lighting here than I do outside there. Yes. So a few questions about, and I'll just answer them. Um, Michael uses newspaper in raccoon firings and that's what I recommend. Newspaper is good. Um, you could also use straw or hay if you want to use that. That's a possibility. Um, I don't recommend sawdust in raccoon firing. Um, 
So questions about using the mold. If you do press too hard, yeah, you might get some seams. So um, don't press as hard. Michael's using continental clay. It's a, their Raku clay. That's the one that he's using tonight. And there it is. Wow. So this is this up. was a piece I took out. Jessica and Kevin saw me taking these pieces out yeah, well. right before we went live. This was a little piece. And this is I didn't see it up close though. Wow. With the leaf impressions done like I showed what you. Glaze? What glaze is that? This is the jade gloss. It's my RG And that's one of yours. And this was and one coat brushed over the leaves and then wiped back with a damp sponge. And then I did three coats on all of the solid areas to get Ooh. that. Yeah. And so this is one of yours. Blues and Great. greens and coppers and fuchsia. Purples and, fuchsias and, and yeah, purples. it's beautiful. So lots of cool colors. This piece is still warm. I'm going to just set it on the concrete here. I'll set it on the kiln. Then this one is the tree. I can't wait to see the tree. You all excited for the tree? I wish we could all hear everybody They're like, yes, the tree. Ooh. I've been waiting to see the tree since he made it two weeks ago. So it's been a long time. It is very, very hot. One of the things I want to mention is I put the cans back on the lid. Um, if you don't do that, they can flame up because there's a lot of hot ashes in there. So I'm going to hold this up quickly. This is the, the um, kaleidoscope. This is the matte finish. And this is, this is a thick piece. So it's hot. And this is the one that I was really dying to see. You can see some smoke still coming out of that can. This is what I don't oh, yeah. want to be breathing in. That's beautiful. This is a, a, the medium size vase, the leafy texture. And this is the jade gloss over the bark and wiped back. And then three coats on the leaves. And that is very hot. I'll set that on my bark texture pad. That's just jade gloss on that as well for a glaze. Yeah. And it looks totally different than the other one. So it's a, a completely different look because yeah. it has more of the gold. And so this one out. has a lot of greens, a lot of gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of green and gold um, in that. Which I really like. And on the bottom, yeah. notice on the bottom, there's more coppers. And so that piece was sitting in all the newspaper. And so that's when I talked earlier about a lot of times when I see pieces get kind of smothered and buried, you get more of the coppers. Things like sawdust, if you use sawdust, a lot of times you'll get um, more coppers on the bottom of your pieces and sometimes a unique texture on there as well. So. Yeah, folks love seeing that jade gloss. That's gorgeous. Yeah, that is. Do you have other examples of your Raku glazes you want to share with us so folks can see what they can get from you if you've got any yeah, available? Grab, I know yeah. we weren't really going to cover that, but why not? And I know we showed the tree, but that went pretty fast, didn't it? And I don't actually have anything done with the duck feathers right now, but this is the but jade gloss. This, that's gorgeous. And I put Mako's yeah. white cobblestone over the top of it. And so look at that cool texture. And so you would expect the white cobblestone would be white on top of there. Um, usually other glazes you put on top of that will pick up that characteristic. So I got the texture and the breakup effect of the cobblestone. Um, and ironically, this was an experiment. I did the white cobblestone on top and then I did purples and blues with stroke and coat on it thinking it would break up. And in between, I would see the metallics of the Raku glaze. And on the top, I would have these blues and purples um, on the breakup of the cobblestone, but all of the, the stroke and coat colors disappeared and basically the Raku glaze kind of takes over that. This one was done with the black cobblestone on top of the jade gloss. So, wow. um, and I'm gonna grab, let me just grab a bowl real quickly here that's done. Uh, This piece was done, this is when I was talking about the coil pieces. Um, this was done inside of a bisque bowl. 
just extruding the coils and overlapping, doing the loops. And this was Raku fired. This piece has been sitting around for a long time and, and Raku will kind of fade over time. Um, so this has lost some of its color. The cool thing is I can put this back in and refire it, do that process. And bring and it back. You'll get all new colors on it. So yeah, already um, <laughs> Every time you do it though, you do kind of shock the piece and there's more of a chance of it breaking. And I always warn people too, when we're doing workshops that pieces can crack. It is a stressful process for the wear and occasionally pieces will crack. I usually have more pieces there for people to do or I'll give them one of my samples if they don't have time to, to refire a piece. So, and if you don't like the finish, put it back in and refire it. But again, every time you refire it, you risk the piece wanting to break. Um, so and I'll use, um, to clean this up, I'll wet the pieces yeah, and I'll use Comet Cleanser and a wire okay. brush to kind of scrape away. Sometimes you'll get some, some discoloration and some ash and some soot kind of on there that you need to clean off. Once they cool, I'll do that. And that's it for cleanup. A lot of folks are like, they could watch this all night. Maybe we have to just do a broadcast showing glazes because who doesn't just look at like, like to look at glazes, all of yeah. us. All right, Michael, goodness. Thank you so much for tonight for the Raku. And thank you so much for that hand building demo with the bowl sphere molds, which I know I got to get on and order some, but I bet all you've ordered them for me. So I'll be waiting longer, but that's okay. I don't mind. I'd like you guys to get them first anyways. All right, we have a giveaway. So we're going to give away a set of three of those bowl sphere molds. And uh, one lucky winner. So the way you enter all of our contests, you just go to clayshare.com and you sign up for our email list and that's how you get entered in these drawings. It's pretty simple. If you missed tonight, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about that, but go ahead and sign up and then you'll be entered in our next one, which will be next Wednesday when I'll be doing the demo. I'm gonna be using some of Michael's small pumpkin molds and we're gonna make, I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but it's a really sweet little project and I think you're all gonna love it. And we're gonna be giving away a set of those molds next week as well. All right, so the winner of this week's prize of the set of three sphere molds. And uh, don't worry, everybody's a winner because this whole month long, Michael is doing a promo with Clayshare. He is doing 10% off on all of his clay puzzling molds when you use the code Clayshare10. So if you don't win, you can at least get a discount on your molds. All right, <laughs> tonight's winner of the set of three is Mr. Frank Hot. Frank Hot. Perfect name for somebody making pottery, hot, because it gets hot in the studio, right? Congratulations, Frank, on winning your set of three. We will email you and email Michael and connect to you guys, and you'll get your molds. So, all right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. It's going to be available for replay forever, so you can come back and use this as a really great resource if you're just learning about Raku. I love the idea of using an electric kiln instead of getting yourself a gas kiln if you're just starting out, because not everybody has access to a gas kiln. I do always recommend, like Michael said, learning from lots of instructors. If there's a local clay center that offers Raku firing or there's a Raku workshop near you, I do recommend you take that first before you attempt to do Raku on your own if you've never done it before or never been part of a Raku firing. But it's something that once you've done it, you, it kind of gets in your blood and you can't stop doing it. I know I love Raku firing. All right, everyone, be well. Michael, thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Take care.